So uh, when when are we finishing? We're finishing up today, then. No, no, next week. We're finishing up next week. So that'd be the last class, and then you're how how much of the class are you going to do? About an hour next week, or you're going to run the full two hours of our master? Sorry. Are you going to do the whole two hour two hours? It depends on how long it takes. I mean, I'll do a full revision of all the examinable topics. Then I'm going to give you feedback forms. And then um, I'll go through the exam in detail. I'm not giving you the exact questions, but you're not going to be going into the exam scratching your head saying, I'm wondering what's going to come up. You know. Okay. And the rationale for that is that then you produce a good answer. Try to. Well, that's the deal. <laughs> it's a deal, huh? <laughs> okay. Now, um, yeah, just one or two things. Um, I wanted to mention just in terms of uh, when you're answering questions in, in the exam, something that looks really, really impressive. You know, the comments that I've been making about, um, you know, this being like uh, um, a combination of the contractual and the proprietary, that sort of an observation. Not everybody comes up with it in the exam, but the thing about it is that when you're able to make that sort of commentary, it makes it look as if you know the stuff so well that you're getting the opportunity to be reflective, right? The other thing too, if you're able to kind of say, well, you know, restrictive covenants step into a breach that easements don't fill, or vice versa if you're answering a question on easements, and even if it's a problem question, it doesn't matter. Take an opportunity to make these one-liners of reflection. Don't be tempted to go off and write a half a page on another area of the law. That's very important. But kind of the sense that you have an overview of the course, or that you're able to throw in the odd comment about you know, how particular interests are protected under you know, land registration rules and stuff like that, what it does is it just brings an extra dimension to your question and it kind of like if everything else is good then you know it puts you well up into the 70s kind of thing so anyway now so then we're looking at the benefit of restrictive covenants in equity as i say the books say very little next to nothing about this area the benefit in law and i suppose it's because the benefits um, of restrictive covenants in equity have been very developed and so the law isn't actually going to really add anything to it you know the other thing too i don't know what what you think of this but um i've had this little thing going in my brain for the last few days and i'm probably completely wrong but i think it's very odd having a remedy at law for an equitable interest because it's one thing if it's arising under the contract, but it's another thing if it's, do you see what I mean? Like, I know the principle that we saw last week that you can't give more than you have, you know, the name of that called not have it, that Latin principle that, like, if I've only got a lease, I can't give you a freehold. I can only give you what I've got or something less, like a license or something. Um, and I know that that principle isn't necessarily transmutable to the type of remedy that's available to you. But it does seem to me to be very odd that you've got remedies of law for what are essentially equitable interests. And I think actually, probably it's because of the continual, this kind of um, this cyclical process that we see a lot of in English land law, that you've got the development of an area of law from the common law, then you've got statutory intervention or maybe something that came from the common law, you've got a bit of equitable intervention, and then statute coming in and saying, well, this right is equitable and that one isn't. So it may have come from that, or I might be just kind of <laughs> operating on a bit of a disconnect at the moment, that it will slot into place, you know, when you go on your exams and I think, oh God, why did I say that? But, you know, there are just these thoughts that you have. The other thing, too, um, that principle of never that quote on habit, and I just thought I'd throw it out here because, again, I did say to you that if you're planning on writing in the future, 
like whether it's, I mean, and that can be no matter what career you follow, you can do, you know, a short article on something or other. Um, the name of that quote now have it, that um, you can't give that you more than you've got. We've already seen that the English courts aren't observing it in the area of leases, but they're also not observing it very rigidly in the area of adverse possession when there's a lease involved, right? Because if a leaseholder is displaced by a squatter, the English courts have, um, well, they've devised a little strategy that the way in which the lease is enforced between, as between, say, the leaseholder and the squatter is different as between the freeholder and the leaseholder. <coughs> so what they actually do, if the leaseholder has been displaced by a squatter, so say you had a lease of a thousand years, somebody comes and squats in your land, displaces you, well, you've got no more title. Like, the squatter then can squat for the rest of the leasehold term. And technically speaking, the freeholder can only come in at the end of the leasehold. But what the English have actually done is they've said, well, no, the lease is only expired as against the squatter. It's not expired as against the freeholder, which is false. So what the leaseholder can do is they can conspire with the freeholder, surrender the lease, and the freeholder can then come in and get the squatter out. And it's a total violation of the principle of you can't give more than you have. Now, the Irish courts haven't followed that. So on that particular issue, the Irish courts have got to totally right and they're stuck to the doctrine. So either a comparative between, you know, squatters type on that particular area, or you could do a general review of the principle of Nemo that code non habit, that you can't give more than you've got in English law and do it across a whole host of different areas. Because the minute you've written something on property law, it gives you kudos. People avoid it for some reason. I don't know. I think it's because it's mathematical. And as I said, that sometimes, um, sometimes actually you've got a team of black letter lawyers that so they come in and they're, it, they're very practitionary. So it's just like I worked with such a team once and it was a bit of a nightmare because like they just basically they had a whole list of questions and you were supposed to learn off well is this a registrable interest is that a registrable interest with no kind of exploration of the case law they didn't bother doing squatter's title because why bother when it's been restricted kind of so they were very black letter um but anyway um the thing about uh land law is i mean hopefully you have seen that it, it is more interesting than that you can take a whole host of different approaches it's very interesting um and if i had more time i'd do it from a case law perspective that you actually read the cases in order to discover what the courts are saying. Because the beauty about that is if you read a whole host of cases in land law, you'll see how many other areas of the law that actually come up in each case. And you know, it's not rigidly compartmentalized in the way in which we teach it, like that you do land, you do contract, you do tort, and you never see that actually an awful lot of cases they'll be dealing across the board with a whole host of different claims from a whole host of different areas of the law. Um, so, um, I've lost my train of thought. Okay, I'll, I'll get it back. Anyway, I'm going to go on and finish this now. Um, the benefits of uh, restrictive covenants. And as I said, these aren't positive. Yeah, these aren't positive co uh, covenants for some reason, but the, the book doesn't seem to deal with them. Now, um, so then the principles in relation to this are that, first of all, um, the covenant must touch and concern the land. So again, it's the same thing that we've seen with the, the benefit um, uh, in, at law and in positive covenants. So the covenant must touch and concern the land. The claimant must have an estate in the land of the original covenantee. And then the benefit must have been transmitted in one of three ways. And the one of three ways was set down, in this case, in 1878, Reynolds and Kalashov. And it's either established by annexation, assignment, or a scheme of development. So the first, um, that the benefit of the covenant um, has to have been transmitted in one of three ways. The first is annexation. And what this requires, and you know whenever you've got three ways and they're kind of successive, it means the first hasn't worked. They've tried again. The second hasn't worked. 
So the purge, they kind of try and get it right or it arises in a different situation or something like that. We've seen an example of this as well um, in easements in um, prescription where you had you know, the common law and then the lost modern grants and then the legislation which actually complicated the issue. But anyway, so three different ways. So the first, it involves the permanent attachment of the benefit of the restrictive covenant to the land. Now immediately you can see a bit of a problem with that because how do you permanently attach the benefit, like an equitable benefit to a, la to a piece of land that's always going to run? That's going to be a bit problematic. Um, in this case, it should pass automatically without a specific mention. And obviously the drafting involved in this, it's very specific and it's very meticulous. So these covenants, they have to be annexed to each and every part of the land. So like the deed would have to specifically state that. Otherwise, if part of the land were sold, the benefit wouldn't pass. Do you see? So if you sold off a plot of your land and not the whole thing, the covenant wouldn't have, if the covenant hadn't been expressed to be attached to each and every part of the land, then the covenant wouldn't run. Or the burden of the, the sorry, the benefit wouldn't pass. So then, um, in the Federated Homes and Mill Lodge Properties case, the question of whether the benefit of covenant restricting the building on a neighbouring plot of land had been annexed was raised. There were no express words of annexation in the conveyance, okay? So like the conveyance doesn't state anything about the covenant being attached to each and every part of the land, but the Court of Appeal held that section 78 of the Law of Property Act had the effect of annexing the benefit of the covenant. And this provides that a covenant in relation to the land of the covenantee shall be deemed to have been made with the covenantee, his successors in title and persons deriving title from under him. Now I'll come back to this in a sec. Uh, section 78, annex the covenant to each and every part. And then in Crest Nicholson case, um, it was confirmed that the benefited land must be identified in the covenant. So there you've got a, a few complexities. So the benefited land has to be identified, but if the covenant hasn't been expressly annexed, then section 78 of the Law of Property Act will step into the gap, right? And you might think that that's very odd. Well, the thing about it is that section 78, um, which we saw earlier, uh, it just says that a covenant relating to any land of the covenantee shall be deemed to be made with the covenantee and his successors in title and the persons deriving title under him or them and shall in effect as if such, such successors and other persons <coughs> be successful. Well, that just really relates to the, the, uh, the successors as opposed to the annexation to the land. But we've seen another example of this sort of thing being done before <coughs> when we were talking about easements and we saw that, um, that you know, easements can be uh, created or they can come into being in a lot of different ways. And you might remember the discussion about section 62, whether it created an express or an implied grant of an easement and that there was disagreement in the literature. Now, so it's not unusual for judges for a start, if they're faced with um, a case like this, just to consult the relevant part of the Law of Property Act, and to read something into the covenant that isn't there. We've seen it already in section 62. And I just want to read you section 62. And just bear in mind, could this be used, um, or could this section have been used in the area of restrictive covenants? And I mean, I'll answer that question afterwards. But anyway, just, just listen. A conveyance of land shall be deemed to include, and shall by virtue of this act offer it to convey with the land, all buildings, erections, fixtures, commons, hedges, ditches, fences, ways, waters, watercourses. And then it comes on, it talks about liberties, like what's a liberty? Privileges, what's a privilege? Easements, rights, and advantages whatsoever, appertaining or reputed to appertain to the land or any part thereof at the time of the conveyance. So there you've got section 62. And it's talking about the reading into conveyances of a whole host of rights that may have existed. And we've seen that section 62 <coughs> operates in the case of easements often to upgrade certain rights to the status of easements 
even though they were never intended as an easement and they weren't existing as an easement. They were just a right. They might have been a right to come on to, to go onto your neighbor's land and to, I don't know, to fix the side of your building. You know, if, if there was an overhang or something like that, that suddenly becomes an easement. And it can obviously become very problematic then because easements are supposed to have a certain nature. You know, you're not supposed to have exclusive possession. It's a right, the idea is a right to pass over, but not to exclude the owner of the Serbian tenement, right? Now, the thing about section 62 is that even though you've got a specific section in the Law of Property Act that relates to the burden of covenants and that relates to the benefit of covenants in the form of section 78 and 79, that doesn't exclude other areas being drafted in. And the thing about it is really good lawyers will chance their arm. Well, actually, section 62 has been specifically excluded by the courts from relating to restricted covenants. So that avenue has been shut down. But I mean, if you're ever in a difficult court case, it's well worth your while to go away and you know become friends with Gail on easements, you know, that type of person that really sort of meticulously goes into stuff or whatever. Now, the other thing about um, section 78 is it's not expressed to be subject to the expression of a contrary intention. So annexation but and the meaning of that is that um it'll only not apply if it's been expressly excluded sorry now oh yeah anyway sorry annexation it'll only occur unless a um it will occur unless a contrary intention is expressed and that's been found in a particular case so basically um Section 79, which relates to the burden, is subject to the expression of contrary intention, so you have to exclude it for it, it not to apply. Section 78 doesn't have any such provision, but the courts have found that it's similar. So in other words, it's not easy to keep out. Yeah, so the court is actually giving itself a lot of flexibility from the law there. That's the, the effect. Uh, remember that now what we're talking about here is the three different ways in which the benefit um, must have been uh, made. So the second one is through assignment. And obviously there were some difficulties in the annexation. And again, if you look at the, the dates of the cases, this is 1933, the case which kind of sorted the matter of annexation. Um, was from 1980. So this is prior to, this would still have had the problems, like this case would still have been heard during the perceived problems of annexation, having to sort of, um, to, to be annexed to each and every part of the property. Um, so with assignment, the assignment of the covenant, it has to be coupled with the transfer of the land and the assignment and the conveyance must be simultaneous. So the assignment must identify the land and it's best to expressly assign the covenant on each conveyance. So the problem with that is that if there's any slip up, then the covenant will lapse. There's nothing to protect. And once the covenant is gone, it can't be revived. Okay. So there's some discussion as to whether the continual assignment is necessary, but the better view is that it is because it's better to be safe than sorry. Okay. And then the last way is through schemes of development. And I mean, I love these, um, these uh, quotes from judges about the difficulty of particular areas. So basically, schemes of development, they're also known as building schemes. And they relate to developments where the land has been in single ownership and it's divided into plots and sold off. So basically, the situation is that rather than having two adjacent properties, You've got mutually enforceable covenants existing between the various owners. And I mean, you can immediately see the problem of that. But imagine if you added in a whole host of different people here, like you added in 100 people that were all going to be sold lots in an original plot belonging to one owner. And there are multiple conveyances down the line. And this person wants to sue that person. And you have a chain of conveyances. And this would all have been prior to the land being registered, so you have to go and get the deed of every, um, it's absolutely nightmarish. So, um, quite difficult. But anyway, the first thing you have to do is you have to establish that, the, uh, that a scheme actually existed. And a building scheme is a type of local law created in relation to the land. 
And um, as McGarry um, said in Brunner and Grover's tale, that it may be indeed that this is one of those branches of equity which work best when explained least. And actually, there's an example of one of these um, building schemes <coughs> outside of Birmingham. Uh, it's a region called Selly Park. It's a very, very nice area. And in the 19th century, um, the owner of a big plot uh, of land, he kind of had a vision for a way, the way in which this particular area of Birmingham would be developed. Now, obviously, there was no kind of planning law at the time. So sometimes you have big landholders who, well, either they wanted to preserve the area or that they were particularly visionary about um, environmental law, um, about you know the need to, to live in a nice place, that sort of thing. So he set up this um, this building scheme, and it's, it's probably the best known one. Now, um, so in Elliston and Rachel, you had a number of different conditions for a building scheme to be recognized. First of all, that the land must be sold by a common vendor, originally. That before the sale, the land must be laid out in lots with common obligations. So it must be clear what people are getting into from the, the get-go. Um, also, the benefits of the covenants must have been for all of the owners and not just the original landowner. And the land must have been bought on the understanding that restrictions were to be enforceable by the owners of other lots. So the mutuality of these schemes um, had to be clear. And this, the law is now a bit more relaxed that, first of all, it's just that the area affected must be identified. And then it must be clear that uh, a scheme was intended to be set up to ensure res the reciprocal uh, enforcement of obligations. So it's helpful then if the land is laid out in lots um, and the authority for those. And the, the, the development actually that I was referring to, Reselly Park, um, uh, it's the Dolphins Conveyance actually um, is that area of Birmingham that I was mentioning. Now, um, just remember then that in relation to remedies in equity, injunctions are available, um, damages can be awarded in lieu of injunctions, and that's since 1858 actually, and that's now governed under the Supreme Court Act. And then you can discharge covenants, although that's fairly difficult to do so. And you know what I was saying about, like there's an awful lot of discussion actually that it's a terrible pity that positive covenants can't be enforced at law because of this problem of you know um, having to mend fences and stuff like that, um, and also of getting people to um, to accept that there are obligations when you're living in a flat towards common common areas, etc. And that there's really no way of doing it. And what they tend to do with lots of flats now is they just they just have long leases because. Um, covenants between landlords and tenants are enforceable and they don't have the same sort of difficulties, they don't run into the same sort of difficulties as you find with freehold covenants. Um, so anyway, one of the, the schemes to kind of address this is they brought in a new type of land holding in 2002 called copyhold. And the idea behind this was that, um, that you would have a sort of a freehold, but that built into it would be an, an acceptance of these covenants. But uh, that was 2002, and six years later, only 14 schemes had taken up this option. And it's because it was highly complex, okay? And then there is a law reform, uh, sorry, a law commission paper on this. They recommended in 2011 that a new land obligation should be created. So a new land obligation in the form of an obligation which was replaced with um, freehold covenants. And what's interesting, they also recommended that it should be classified as a new legal interest in land. And that would actually require an amendment um, being made to the Law of Property Act 1925. So that you know in those like that um, you had legal estates in a freehold in possession and a term of years absolute, or that you had interests which, you know, the rent charge, uh, the easement, etc they were recommending that the land obligation actually be added into that. Now, but nothing has been done. Um, you know, they've made that recommendation and it's kind of sitting there. It's a very good idea as well if you're researching um, like this for an exam or for a paper, whatever, that you do actually have a look at that. I mean, the reports are absolutely massive, but they've always got a summary, but you just don't mention the summary. Do you know what I mean? 
like if if you're wanting to score points in an exam answer then you wouldn't obviously say well in the summary of the law committee report you'd say the law committee and i'm just trusted you know but as i say don't write a page you don't have scope it's not an essay so it's a reference that you've got an overview of the course you've got an overview of the material etc and then so the summary is benefits of covenants positive and restrictive can run in law and inequity only the burdens of restrictive covenants can run and then only in equity okay so you can see that here. and I'm, I'm hoping that that's right because you know often like you go over and over and over in something and you've actually done something slightly off but I mean, hopefully not now you'll be delighted or very sad to know this is not examinable so there are six topics in all the six that you've done so far so the registered unregistered land pump, um adverse possession uh, easements mortgages leases and troubles so i'll do a full revision next week if you've got any questions in the meantime do email me like if you want particular attention paid to something that's absolutely fine and then as i say i'll bring in student feedback forms um next week so if you have an opportunity just to comment on the course and then i'll go through the paper without quite any other questions but um any questions no? okay. well, thanks Thank you.